Okay, go ahead and start that. All right, now. I'm thinking this is about where we, yeah, we want to talk about muscle contraction. So, uh, well, remember, I just kind of review a little bit, and then we'll get into um, into the fresh stuff. All right. Remember when muscles are going to contract? There's a nerve impulse that comes along. And it comes to the end of the nerve at a synaptic knob. And what is the material that's released from the synaptic knob? Acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then goes across, let's shut this off for a minute, goes across the gap between the synaptic knob and the um, uh, motor end plate of the nerve, or excuse me, of the muscle, and what is that gap called between the two? The synaptic cleft. And the acetylcholine then combines with specific acetylcholine receptors, which are membrane fleshing embedded proteins. And what happens as a result of that combining of the um, acetylcholine with the acetylcholine receptors. Depolarization. How does the membrane depolarize? What causes a depolarization to occur? Something opens up. What's the something that opens up? Sodium channels. And sodium comes flooding in, and the charge on that section of the membrane, right there at that, uh, uh, right there at that uh, motor end plate, depolarizes. And then, as the sodium enters and starts to stream off to adjacent areas, what happens to the sodium channels there? They open up too, right? So, in other words, the depolarization just spreads right down the membrane. All right? It propagates. It, you know, just basically um, self depolarizes in a sense. Once you start in one area, it just kind of spreads to adjacent areas. All right, now, as that's occurring, we come to the T-tubules. And what are the T-tubules? They're extensions of what? The membrane, right? They go down into the sarcoplasm. And we bring over our little model here. Remember that the yellow lines that you see on this thing are representing the T-tubules, all right? And the green part here is representing what? It's a modified endoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum, yes. All right, now, what is stored in this sarcoplasmic reticulum when the muscle is relaxed? Calcium ions. All right. So the T tubules depolarize, and in turn, they cause the calcium ion channels here to open. All right. And calcium comes flooding out into the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell. And what happens when calcium comes in? It's going to bind to the troponin. Right, remember that? And the next thing you know, you get, yeah, there we go. You get contraction, all right? All right, so there we are. So now, let's just pick up with the slides and continue. And so, as we know here in our preliminary, 
a uh, neuron has released the acetylcholine, and that is going to cross the synaptic cleft. It has bound to the um, acetylcholine receptors that are there in that motor end plate part of the membrane of the muscle cell. The acetylcholine now causes the membrane to be polarized, and as we know, by opening the sodium channels in that area, and then that will cause sodium channels to open in adjacent areas, and the depolarization just spreads right down, right down the membrane and down into the T tubules. And so, as it goes down the T tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum now becomes more permeable to calcium. The calcium is released and diffuses into the sarcoplasm. And now the sliding filament theory. Now it's called sliding filament theory because, in essence, what's going to happen are these thin filaments are going to slide over, or more appropriately, be pulled over the thick filaments as the process occurs. And as it occurs, of course, these Z discs or Z lines are going to actually end up getting closer together as the process ensues. All right, so now, what happens? Well, calcium goes flooding in to the sarcoplasm, and the calcium is now going to bind to the troponin that's there. All right? And so the troponin now binding calcium, that's going to alter its shape. And when you alter the shape of the troponin, it's going to pull on that trophomycin strand that's actually attached to it. And we pull the trophomycin off of the myosin binding sites on the active molecules. All right? And now those myosin binding sites are exposed, and myosin heads are now able to come up and attach to the actin and start the process of pulling those thin filaments in toward the center of the sarcomere. All right, and there are basically four steps that we can describe in this process. So we'll go through it, and then I think I have an animation that I can show you, which I finally found. And of course, guess where is in the most obvious place? I couldn't find it in the last time. So I thought I would put the link on the web page so you shall take care of that. All right, number one, cross-bridge attachment. Now, cross-bridge formation occurs when a myosin head attaches to an actin molecule. And where does it attach? At that myosin binding site on actin. So if this arm is a light chain, and here's one of those myosin heads, it's going to come up and it's going to attach. And there it is. All right? That's all there is to the cross bridge attachment. So we have this actin myosin cross bridge. All right? Next, the working or power stroke. All right, now, these myosin heads were set to their high energy bent position. Why? Because bound to this thing is an ADP and an inorganic phosphate. Now, what do the letters ADP stand for? Adenosine diphosphate, right? And if you add a phosphate onto ADP, what do you get for your efforts? ATP, and those letters are standing for adenosine triphosphate, right? All right, so we've hydrolyzed an ATP and got it in that high energy position. It's bound to this. Power stroke, it bends. And when it bends, it actually pulls on these thin filaments and it pulls them in toward the center of the sarcomere just a little bit. In fact, each one of these power strokes will probably pull this in about 1% of its length. All right, not very much. All right, and there we go. Now, the other thing that's going to happen, as that head bends, as it forms the power stroke, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate that have been attached to the myosin head come off. All right, they're released. 
So as it's bending, as it's taking the power stroke, off comes the ADP and the inorganic phosphate that have been attached to it. All right, so we have the attachment at step one, the working or power stroke is step two, the release of the ADP and inorganic phosphate. Step three is cross bridge detachment. How do we get it to detach? We add on an ATP. So you add an ATP to that low energy, now low energy minus a head, and it detaches from the thin filament. All right? Now that's all there is to that. So we've had attach, we've had power stroke, we've had detach. And you detach it by adding on an ATP. Now there's just one more thing to do before we can start it all over again. And that is caulking the myosin head. Getting it from its low energy position to its high energy or bent position. How do you do that? hydrolyze a molecule of ATP. So the ATP attached to the myosin head, it detached from acne. Then you hydrolyze the ATP and that cocks the head, gets it ready for the next way on. All right? So now we just repeat it. Attach, power stroke, detach, cock the myosin head. You just keep going on and on and on. And as that repeats each time, these get about 1% shorter until ultimately there's complete overlap of thick and thin filaments. You pull these thin filaments in as far as they can go. And now the sarcomere, and thus the myofibril, and thus the muscle cell itself is contracted. And how much shorter is it? Well, contracted muscle cell is just about 30% the length of its original length. So it's about a third, about a third shorter than it was originally. And as we know here, you know, each working stroke, each power stroke shortens the muscle about 1%. All right? And there we go. And when they're fully contracted, they're about 30% shorter than they were when they were relaxed. Now that's all there is to it. It's just those four steps over and over again. As long as the calcium is there, bound to troponin, you keep getting this bind, power stroke, detach, compromise the head to reset, and you just keep going over and over again until it's fully contracted. All right. Now you're going to get to relax. Well, getting calcium in here got the process underway. How are we going to stop it and get it to relax? Get rid of the calcium. Where did the calcium come from originally? What's this green stuff? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Where's it going? Back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. How are we going to get it there? Well, embedded in that sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, and it's a membrane, are calcium channel pumps. And those calcium pumps are going to do just exactly as the name implies. They're going to pull the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right? And of course, nothing's free. It requires ATP to fuel the calcium pump. All right? So it takes lots and lots of ATP for this process, as you can see. I mean, every one of those myosin heads is using an ATP every time it binds, power strokes, and releases on, you know, and cocks in the head and all that. Every one of those cycles is using an ATP for each and every one of those minus and molecules. Now, to get it to relax, we've got to have even more ATP to help suck that calcium out of here and pump it back into the sarcoplasm in particular. All right, now. What's going to happen? As the calcium levels drop, they're going to come off the troponin. And they're going back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, when you take the calcium away from the troponin, what happens to the shape of the troponin molecule? It goes back to its resting shape. And as it does, what else does it take along for the ride? It pulls on that tropomyosin, right, and pulls it back over now, like putting a blanket over, if you will, 
pulls the trochomyosin right back over the myosin binding sites on the actin molecules, covers them up. Now there's nowhere for those myosin heads to bind. And if they're not attached to actin, elastic filaments are now going to take over. And what is the protein of which the elastic filaments are made? What's it called? The T word. Titan, right? What does Titan do? Pulls those Z lines right back out to their rested position and the muscle is relaxed. All right? Remember, it's like a spring that will actually then uh, you know, go between the Z-disc and the thick filaments, and it will now pull the Z-discs back to their resting position. And there it is, and it's done. Now, how do we get the signals to do this relaxation? Well, what was that neurotransmitter that started the process? Acetylcholine. Well, guess what happens to acetylcholine? We don't have any more being released from the nerve. And what happened with the acetylcholine that was released from the nerve? It was broken down by acetylcholine esterase enzyme. And where did we find that acetylcholine esterase enzyme? It is out there in the motor end plate area of the muscle cell. It is another membrane-bound protein that you find in that motor end plate region of a muscle cell. And so as acetylcholine comes along, it breaks it down. So if you want to keep the cells contracting, you have to continually keep releasing acetylcholine. Okay? Because when you stop, acetylcholine esterase gets it all broken down into acetic acid and choline, which are inactive, the membrane repolarizes, membrane repolarizes, calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, muscles relax. Now what could be simpler than that? Not much of anything. All right. Now see, that isn't all that complicated. Explain that to someone at dinner night who's really impressed with what you learned today. Right? Well, I would hope. All right. Now, that's simple. Now, you know, nerve gases, they screw this process up. They actually, there's a couple of ways they can work. They might mimic acetylcholine, where they bind the receptors and the acetylcholine esterase can't break them down. All right. Or they interfere with the action of acetylcholine esterase, so the acetylcholine binds and nothing breaks it down. Well, what happens in a case like that? They just stay contracted, right? And what happens to you if you're exposed to nerve gas and you get your muscles contracted permanently like that? That's exactly right. You don't breathe in, you soon suffocate, among other things. <coughs> That's the good that you can. All right. And then speaking of something else, this we'll all experience one of these days, not that you'll have any recollection of it, I doubt, but anyhow, at least I hope I know. But anyway, rigor mortis, now what is that? Terminal stiffening of the sinews is one way to, to define it. All right. You die. A couple hours later, you get stiff. Right? Why? Muscles will contract. You're not going to relax. Why not? Calcium is going to escape from that sarcoplasmic reticulum. You're running out of ATP, you know. And you can't pump it back in, so it floods out, and it causes the proponent to move over, and the muscles then start to contract. And remember now, how do we get them to relax? What did you have to do? You had to pump the calcium out of there. What does it take to fuel the calcium pump? 
ATP, well, you don't have any more. So what's going to happen? They just contract and they stay contracted. They're stiff until you start to decay and the proteins start to break down. Then you relax again in a couple of days. All right? Well, that's simple, isn't it? Yes. 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 But the relaxation won't be in the usual manner, of course, because now the proteins themselves will actually start to break down. Okay? No, because there's no ATP there to pump that calcium back out. And it wouldn't matter if you did. It wouldn't be more ATP to cause contraction in the future anyway. All right. Now let's take a look at this, and then we'll look at the animation. So let's see. Let's douse the lights, and our light switcher isn't back here today, so I'll have to do it myself. All right. Now, this is actually in your book. But I think they did a really nice job with it. All right, here we have the relaxed muscle. Now, there are the thick filaments, all right, kind of the lavender. And remember, those are made of myosin, and they have the two heads on them. And these myosin heads are already set to their high energy or top position because what's attached to them? ADP and phosphate, right? All right, but they are on the thin filaments. The Actin molecules, the myosin binding sites of the actin, are covered up by tropomyosin. All right, now it's time to add calcium. So what happens? Calcium binds to troponin. That alters its shape. And as it alters the shape of the troponin, the troponin pulls those tropomyosin molecules off the myosin binding sites of actin. And going back to my food images again, those actins look sort of like purple pimento stuff olives to me, don't, don't you think? Well, where the pimento would go, that is the binding site. And it's now openly exposed. And here are those high energy caught myosin heads, all ready to go for step one, which is cross-bridge attachment. So what do they do? They come right up here and latch on to the closest actin molecule. All right? What's the second step? Power stroke. Here it is. Bending of those myosin heads. Now, if they're bending, what's happening to this thin filament? It's getting pulled in toward the center of the sarcomere just a little bit. All right, what about the ADP and the inorganic phosphate? That's been released. All right, what was the third step? Detach, right? How do we get it to detach? We added ATP. It binds to those low energy, this time, myosin heads, and causes them to release the actin. All right, and then, next step, Cough the myosin heads, how? Hydrolyze the ATP to ADP and phosphate. They're now cocked, and they're ready now to continue the next round of shortening of the, um, of, of the uh, sarcomere. The filaments don't change in length, you notice. The thin filaments are the same length they always were. The thick filaments are the same length they always were. The sarcomere shortens because we increase the overlap between the thick and thin filaments. All right, so here we go again. Another round. Attach, power stroke, and release the ADP and phosphate. Detach by adding an ATP. Coptomize some heads. Attach, power stroke. Detach, cock the heads. Just keeps going as long as what? Calcium is sitting there on that actin, and you don't run out of ATP. Okay? Now, when we want the muscle to relax, what are we going to take away? Well, it isn't going to be like taking the punch bowl away from the party. We're going to take away the calcium, right? So, where's the calcium going to go? 
it's going back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And as it does, what's going to happen with this calcium here? Comes right off where we end up, right back where we start. The resting position. So the troponin goes back to its resting shape, pulling the tropomyosin right back over the myosin binding sites on actin. Even though those, even though those myosin heads are in their cocked or high energy position, there's nowhere for them to go. They can't attach to actin because the binding sites on actin are now covered up. And what pulls the Z discs back to their resting position? Titan, which makes up those elastic filaments. Now, what could be simpler than that? Not much of anything. Is it? So what are the four steps? What are the four steps? You bind the calcium onto troponin, and off comes the tropomyosin, and away we go. And what were those four steps that we said that myosin acted do with each other? Cross bridge attachment. Next is power stroke, next is detach, next is coptomize some heads, and then you just keep doing it over and over again until the muscle is contracted. Alright? Or else something comes along and takes away the calcium and of course we know how to do that. We repolarize the membrane and that's the signal for those calcium pumps to pump that calcium right back in. Now the calcium <coughs> pumps are always operating to some extent. But, you know, but if you, if you stop the release of calcium, it's quickly then eventually pump back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, so there we go. And, of course, here's just another little thing showing relax. Here's the Z lines. Here are the thick filaments, thin filaments. All right, as it's contracting, the thin filaments are being pulled with the thick filaments over them. And the Z discs are getting closer together. And then when it's fully contracted, we basically have complete overlap of thin filaments over the thick filaments. And the Z discs are as close together as they're going to get. Now, bands. A bands, I bands, right? A bands are the dark staining area in the center of the sarcomere. What? makes up the A band, what's present in the A band. Thick filaments and a little overlap of thin filaments, right? What about the I bands out here on the end? What do you got there? Just thin filaments and Z discs, right? Now, what happened to the I bands when it's contracted? They disappeared, didn't they? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. All right, here is an actual electron micrograph. Relaxed, contracting, fully contracted. A band here, I band there, there's the Z discs. As it contracts, what happens? The I band gets smaller. When it's fully contracted, there's the I band. I didn't see it. Why not? Well, because now what have we done? We've got complete overlap of our thick and thin filaments, just like the model here. The I bands are gone when it's fully contracted. Well, that's only temporary because when it relaxes, there they are again. All right? And what pulled the Z discs and the I uh, and the thin filaments basically back out to their starting positions? Elastic filament made of the T word, Titan. Excellent. All right, now what could be simpler than that? Not much of anything. So I think it's time. Let's try looking at our little animation. And let me cut the lights on this and we'll see how well it works. Uh, and I'll try to get this on the web page. I finally found it. 
So just bear with me for a little bit. I'm going to have to switch gears here. Okay, let's see. I think it's here. Oh, here it is. And let's see. Let's click on the sound. And away we go. We move our bodies by shortening or contracting our muscles. Uh, Let's take a closer look. A muscle consists of parallel muscle fibers. Each fiber is a single cell in close contact with a motor neuron. Each muscle cell contains bundles of parallel myofibrils, shown in red, surrounded by endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. An action potential traveling down a motor neuron initiates an action potential in the muscle cell. The action potential spreads along the membrane and down the tubules that extend into the cytoplasm, causing the myofibrils to contract. Each myofibril consists of a series of sarcomeres arranged end to end. The sarcomere is the contractile unit of muscle. Each sarcomere consists of thick filaments of myosin, shown in purple, and thin filaments of actin, shown in orange. A sarcomere contracts when its actin filaments slide past its myosin filaments. Contraction shortens the sarcomere, but does not change the length of the actin or myosin filaments. The myosin filaments have heads that bind and pull actin repeatedly, shortening the sarcomere. How do the myosin heads pull actin? In a relaxed muscle, the myosin binding sites on actin are blocked by a protein complex, and ADP and phosphate are bound to each myosin head. An action potential causes the ER to release calcium ions, which bind to the protein complex, causing it to shift and expose the myosin binding sites. The myosin head binds to actin. When ADP and phosphate are released, the myosin head bends, pulling the actin. This is called the power stroke. Next, ATP binds to the myosin head, causing it to detach from actin. When the ATP is broken down to ADP and phosphate, the myosin head extends. The sequence repeats as long as calcium ions are present. Bind, power stroke, detach, extend. The combined work of many myosin heads causes the actin filaments to slide past the myosin filaments. When the action potentials stop, calcium ions are pumped back into the ER. The myosin binding sites on actin are again blocked, and the muscle relaxes. During muscle contraction, actin filaments are pulled toward the center of the sarcomere. The simultaneous contraction of the sarcomeres shortens the myofibrils, and the entire muscle cell contracts. This is how a muscle cell responds to action potentials in the motor neuron. When many muscle cells contract together, the result is movement. I think that shows that quite well. Okay, so back to the sleeping pill. And, so you have been a little sleep. I'll keep yelling and screaming, and I'll turn the lights back on. All right, now, as we've seen, ATP is really key to this process. It takes a lot of ATP, and you notice in that animation, where you can see, you know, all of those myosin heads in action. Every single one of those is taking a molecule of ATP in order to make it move. Every time it moves just a little bit, you know, there's a molecule of ATP being hydrolyzed in ADP and phosphate. So how do we get it? 
Well, there are three pathways, two of which we've already talked about. There's the aerobic, using glycolysis in the Krebs cycle, which is by far the most efficient. Because how many ATPs are net from a complete oxidation of glucose by the uh, process of glycolysis and, uh, and the Krebs cycle, and of course, oxidative phosphorylation protein is a good measure. 36. Now, anaerobic. Muscle cells are able to use the anaerobic pathway, which is just glycolysis, combined with fermentation. How many ATPs are net from just glycolysis alone? Two. Two. All right. Not nearly as efficient, but at least you're able to make some ATP keep contraction going for a while. Now, there is a third way to get energy, and it's something called direct phosphorylation, and that involves the action of something called creatine phosphate, and we'll take a look at that one here in a second. All right, but here's something that we want to mention, and that is, of course, if you want to keep muscles contracting, you've got to have plenty of ATP. And if you run out of ATP, if you run short of ATP, what happens to the muscles? They become fatigued. And <laughs> when muscles become fatigued, they stop contracting. All right? Now that's simple, isn't it? Yes. All right, direct phosphorylation. All right, creatine phosphate is involved here. Now where on earth do we get that? Well, creatine phosphate is produced in muscle by combining creatine and phosphate. Creatine is formed in the liver. It's made in the liver, it's put out in the blood, and it's taken up by muscle. Muscle combines creatine and phosphate. Voila, creatine phosphate. Now, when you want to make an ATP, what do you have to do? You take an ADP and you add a phosphate onto it. So, start with creatine phosphate, break off the phosphate, stick it on an ADP. What have you got for your efforts? ATP. Simple as can be. What about the part that you have left that you broke the phosphate off of? Well, it's no longer creatine. Instead, it's now a slightly different compound called creatinine. And creatinine is a waste product. So, creatine phosphate, break off the phosphate, what's left? Creatinine. What does the creatinine do? It goes out into the blood, and it goes to the kidney, and the kidney takes it out and puts it in the urine and eliminates it. So it's all eliminated. Normally, we have very little creatinine in our blood. And if you've got a high level of creatinine in your blood, you know what that probably means? You probably have decreasing renal function. It's used very often as a way of monitoring renal function. Because the amount we make per day is fairly constant. It's all eliminated. And so if creatinine levels are rising in the blood, it probably indicates decreasing renal function. Kidneys aren't eliminating it like they should. All right? So there's a two for one, if you will. All right? Simple enough. All right, and there we go. Now, fermentation. Remember that one usually occurs anaerobically. All right, so we have glycolysis operating. Glycolysis takes a glucose molecule, what comes out at the end, two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid, right? Remember that? Can never forget it. All right, now, in order to keep that glycolysis going, we've got to oxidize NADH back to NAD. There was a question on the last test, as I recall. And in order to do that, fermentation can work if the Krebs cycle isn't operating, it won't be, without oxygen. So, what happens? You take the 
pyruvate and it's converted by fermentation into lactate or lactic acid. All right? Now, what happens with the lactic acid? Well, the lactic acid simply goes out into the blood and it goes off to the liver and the liver removes the lactic acid and the liver then has a very clever little pathway whereby it can take lactic acid and convert it back to glucose. Now, it's not the most energy efficient thing as we'll see, but it certainly can happen. But here's something else to note while we're at it. It takes about 30 minutes in well-conditioned muscles to remove the lactic acid. If you've got muscles that aren't well conditioned, it might take considerably longer. Now, how many of you have ever done some exertion using muscles that have kind of fallen into disuse, shall we say? How do you feel for a couple of days? Sore. You know why? You're going to have that soreness as long as there's lactic acid in the muscle. That's what gives you the soreness. All right? So, well-conditioned muscles shed it fairly quickly. Those that aren't so well-conditioned hang on to it a little longer, and there's the soreness. All right? All right. In order to recycle that lactic acid, we've got this thing called the Cori cycle. And it's basically a combo of anaerobic, aerobic sort of thing. Part of it's in the muscle, part of it's in the liver. And here's what happens with it. The liver cells are going to convert the lactic acid or lactate back to pyruvate, back to glucose, and then if there's excess, they can even store it as glycogen. All right. Cori cycle is aerobic in the liver, and the liver portion of this is called gluconeogenesis. And there's another term to add to your growing lexicon. And let's get out our terminological dissecting kit. Gluco refers to glucose. Neo means new. Genesis refers to creation or formation. Literally, making new glucose. All right? Let's give you a prim and proper definition. Gluconeogenesis is producing glucose from non-carbohydrate materials. Producing glucose from non-carbohydrate material. All right, lactic acid is one of the things we can use. Another thing, quite often it's used, amino acids. All right? Now, not every cell is capable of doing it's almost like taking glycolysis and reversing it. Well, there are some key enzymes that are needed here, and they're not found in every cell. The only cells that typically have this ability are liver cells and kidney cells. Those are typically the only organs that can perform gluconeogenesis. All right? Now, one of the places you can find this too is operating in uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. And there, proteins are oftentimes being broken down, the amino acid cycle into the glucose. What happens to you if you're doing that? Are you bulking up if you're doing that? Probably not. You're probably wasting away. And here's the fun part about it. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of glucose there you can't use it so well as the body do. It makes more by breaking down proteins. You start wasting away, and then the next thing you know, guess what happens to you? Well, something gets you, and you just kind of, that's it. Probably keto acidosis, too. But anyhow, but be that as it may, there we go. All right, now let's take a look at all right, here's the part that's in the muscle, here's the part that's in the liver. Now remember in the muscle, we're under anaerobic conditions because we're using fermentation. All right, we depleted the cell of oxygen, there's not enough oxygen there, we had to go to fermentation. 
glucose oxidized to two pyruvates, there's the ATP, then the two lactates, those go out in the blood, off to the liver, taken up, converted into pyruvate, converted into glucose. Now, what do you have to add to the two pyruvates to get the glucose, though? Six ATPs. Not all that energy efficient, is it? But it's better than just throwing them away. Right? And another thing, too. You know, we hope this is just a temporary state of affairs. You couldn't go on like this forever. Okay? There you go. Now, simple enough, isn't it? All right, so the Cori cycle is a way to recycle that lactic acid out of the muscles back to glucose. But where is the production of glucose going to take place? Liver. Okay? Now, fast twitch versus slow twitch muscles. All right, some muscles contract and relax much more rapidly than others. The ones that have the shorter uh, contraction time duration are the fast twitch ones. And the ones that are a little slower are called, what else, slow twitch. Now, Let's take a look at fast first. All right. Sometimes these are called white muscles. They're not white. All right. They're pinker. You know, they're not as deep red as red muscles would be. Why? Well, they have less myoglobin, for one thing. All right. They contract and relax faster. Now, best example for these muscles that control the eye movement like the extraneous eye or extrinsic eye muscles. All right, position the eyes. Typically, you're going to find muscles that are responsible for reflexes are going to have more of these fast twitch fibers in them. Now, a lot of other muscles in the body are a mix of both kinds, fast and slow. But if they're key to reflexes that are there to preserve your life, uh, they're probably going to have more of these fast twitch fibers in them. All right? And I mean, let's be honest. When would you need to have really good fast reflexes? Well, yes. Let's suppose you're piloting a plane, a supersonic plane, at, um, oh, I don't know, 2,000 miles an hour, so you can go that fast. Some of you maybe can. Uh, you know, how long does it take you to get into trouble if you make the wrong move? No. Split second, yes. Well, you know, you want to have good reflexes so you don't mess up, right? All right. Well, you've got to be able to keep those eyes going. You've got to keep these muscles here operating. You know, that, that quick. All right. Why can't they? Well, they have a more extensive network of capillaries, a more extensive network of, uh, actually not capillaries, but sarcoplasm and reticulum, so they can release and take up calcium a lot faster. They actually have fewer capillaries, shame on you for saying that. And they have less myoglobin. That's why, as we said, they have that, that pale appearance. Well, now, I wonder what the implications for all this are. Well, if they can quickly release and take out calcium, what does that do with their ability to contract and relax? Well, the faster you can release calcium, the faster they'll contract, right? Okay. And the faster you can take that calcium back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the faster they're going to relax, right? Well, what's the bit about the myoglobin and the capillary network? What's that got to do with anything? What's myoglobin for? Stores oxygen, that's right. Well, if there's less myoglobin, these don't store as much oxygen. What are the implications for that? What about the ability for them to keep contracting and relaxing repeatedly? It's not going to be as good. They're going to more quickly become fatigued, or they're not, because they're going to run out of ATP fairly quickly. You know, yeah, they can contract and relax rapidly, but they don't have long duration for that. 
because when they run short on ATP, they're going to become quickly fatigued. Right? Particularly compared to the slow twitch kind, which are more red because they've got more myoglobin, and they also have a more extensive capillary network. But they aren't going to have as efficient a sarcoplasmic reticulum. So they don't release the calcium as rapidly, they don't take it back up as rapidly, but they do have more myoglobin and more mitochondria and a more extensive capillary network. So what about their persistence? Well, maybe they can't contract and relax as fast, but they can keep it up a lot longer without getting fatigued without running out of ATP. Because, I mean, after all, they got more oxygen available to them, and what about the fact they've got more mitochondria? Well, what are mitochondria good for? Makes ATP, right. All right, so there you go. More endurance here. Less susceptible to fatigue. So if you're running a marathon, these are the ones you want to use, right? Yes. All right. On. Well, we're going to see this again when we get to nerves. You either get contraction or you don't with muscles. If they contract, they fully contract. And if not, well, they don't do anything. They stay relaxed. What brings about contraction? You supply them with a threshold stimulus. What's that? That is the lowest degree of stimulation that will cause contraction to occur. What caused it? What provided the stimulus to get the muscle to contract? What did we have to release? from a synaptic knob of a neuron, acetylcholine. Now remember, it's going to take a certain amount of acetylcholine to open a certain number of sodium channels. If you do, you get contraction. If you don't, you just put out a little tiny sprinkling of acetylcholine. What happens? It's very quickly broken down by acetylcholine esterase. You don't open enough sodium channels, you don't get any contraction. All right, there you go. A sub-threshold stimulus, well, that's the sprinkling of acetylcholine. They're awesome enough to open enough sodium channels to depolarize the membrane adequately. You get no contraction. All right? So a threshold will cause a contraction. Sub-threshold will not. All right, anything less than threshold, sub-threshold, won't cause contraction. If you stimulate a contraction, you get complete contraction. Okay? Now, what about graded contractions? Well, as we know, we can. I mean, you know, I can pick this thing up quite gingerly, right? Or I can really crush. Well, it's depends on how many muscle fibers I have contracting. You know, the more fibers I can stimulate, and the more contracted, the tighter I'm going to grip it. All right? And the fewer muscle fibers I bring into play in a situation, well, the more gingerly I'm going to pick it up. All right? Now, there we go. It's just that simple. Trip. Trip is the staircase of that. Now, this is why athletes tend to warm up before they, uh, you know, enter the race. Because the initial contractions are not going to be as powerful as subsequent contractions of muscles. And it all probably has to do, as we know, with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The longer you keep contracting and relaxing the muscles, the faster the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium and takes it back up again. All right? And so, it's, you know, for that reason, you know, folks that are going to, to run a race, they're going to do some warm-up exercises, stretching the muscles, getting them used to contracting and relaxing, 
and they're going to work much more efficiently and contract more powerfully. Now, see, that just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yes. And muscle tone. Well, that is essentially handled automatically, really by reflexive action. And reflexes are automatic, if you will, responses. And so what happens here? Well, spinal reflexes, spinal nerves, activate alternating motor units. So some are contracting, some are relaxed, and then reverse. And that helps to maintain posture, all right, because it stiffens joints, you know, and other things. All right, there you go. Simple enough, right? What happens to muscles that have no tone? They turn to flab, don't they? Well, we'll look at that next. All right, well, I guess we got one more thing first. Then we'll get to the old use it or lose it bit. Why? There's about three good reasons. Well, isotonic versus isometric contractions. Isotonic contractions are where muscles move below. So, they tend to shorten and move below. Isometric the muscle doesn't change length, even though it's contracting. It's not moving anything. All right, now let's see. What would be a good example of that? Well, let's suppose I'm pushing on the board with all my might. Is the wall going anywhere? Even though I heard something crash. <laughs> but I'm still exerting muscles, and they're trying to contract. I mean, you know, they're calcium lines flooding out and cross bridges attaching power stroking not doing anything and so on alright, there you go now the effects of exercise the old use it or lose it bit alright what does aerobic exercise do? Well, basically three things it stimulates capillary growth around the muscles, all right? So if you are exercising muscle, you're encouraging the growth of capillaries, more capillaries in that area. So you can deliver more blood. Well, what's blood got to do with it? What's blood breaking apart? Oxygen. Oxygen and glucose, right? Yes, both of which are essential to make ATP. Well, <laughs> get more mitochondria if you have cells, muscle cells that are being repeatedly used. That will stimulate them to increase the number of mitochondria. Remember, mitochondria are self-replicating organelles. Alright? And cells are also stimulated to produce more myoglobin. What's that got to do with anything? Store more oxygen. All right, and more mitochondria, well, they can make more ATP. And remember, it takes a glut of ATP to get muscles to contract and relax, right, as we've seen. So the cells really develop a far more efficient metabolism, and they're less susceptible to fatigue, because what do we say fatigue means? Running low on... ATP. Well, these cells are going to have more ATP because they can oxidize more glucose and make more ATP. All right? There you go. Now, what about this use? Well, it's just the opposite, really. Because what's going to happen there is that muscle cells can actually atrophy if they're not used. And this can happen particularly if paralytic situations. In fact, like with muscular dystrophy, muscles can actually end up being replaced by scar tissue, that's the dense fibrous connective tissue, or, in more extreme cases, by adipose. And I don't think you're going to get any contraction out of either one of those. Right? I don't think so. No. All right, there you go. Now, let's switch gears a bit, and let's talk a little bit about cardiac muscles.
Is yes. that reversible if it gets at, if it gets to that point? Huh? Is that reversible in the muscle? No, it isn't. No, if the muscle is turning at the end of like adipose, no, it's not going to revert the muscle. You know, like in really extreme cases of muscular dystrophy, like they may look like they have a really problem with gastric mimicus, and it's really just fat. No, that won't, no. That won't be reversible. All right, cardiac muscle cells. Now, you know, if there are any muscles in the body that you don't want becoming fatigued, I think we would all agree it's these, right? Just what happens if they do? Oh, they can if you push them hard enough, but what happens if they do? That's right. I see several people giving me the sign. All right. Well, where do we find cardiac muscle cells? Well, as we know, they're only found in the walls of the heart, and that's it. All right, they're very similar in many respects to skeletal muscles, but there are some important differences, and here they are. Let's take a look at some of the histological um, features. Okay, number one, they are uninucleated. Now, how is that different from skeletal cells? Right. Scalpel muscle is multinucleated. All right. Now, it's, it's also a function of size, because remember, what is the shape of a scalpel muscle cell? It's a long cylinder. Right. And how long can they be? How long the muscle is? These are not as big. So they can be uninucleated, and they are. And shape-wise, they have a branch quadrangular shape. All right? Now, they have a more abundant sarcoplasm and more mitochondria. That's good, because you don't want them getting fatigued. And they're not going to get fatigued if they produce lots of ATD. And those mitochondria come in handy for that. They also have larger T tubules. Now, T tubules are related to depolarization and contraction, right? Well, one thing about cardiac cells, you don't want individual cells contracting. You want them to contract together as a unit, all right? And you're going to need a very efficient means of depolarizing the cells so those bigger T tubules come in handy there. And there's something else that comes in very handy, and that is this, the gap junctions. Now, do you remember gap junctions as a type of intercellular junction? Now, like type junctions, desmosomes of gap junctions, remember what they were? They were like little ion channels from one cell to another, going one cell to the other cell, to the neighboring cell. All right, ions can very quickly stream through those gap junctions. And here again, that is related to a ability of these cells to contract together as a unit, rather than just individual cells here and there. Okay? You want them to contract together as a unit. So having bigger T tubules, having uh, gap junctions is going to favor that. Now, one thing that is very odd is the fact that their sarcoplasm in particular isn't actually as well developed. But before you get your hanky out and ball your eyes out for the four things, keep in mind they can release the calcium a lot more efficiently. <coughs> in fact, they can release more calcium when they're actually stimulated to do so than you find with skeletal cells. All right, now here is a diagram. And let's see, let's cut the lights and make the show a little better. And up there at the upper left corner, we've got a um, photomicrograph, a very nice one too, of, of heart muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells. This, I, I forget where I got it. This does not come out of your book. Uh, but you see they have this branch shape. And they're uninucleated. There's only a single nucleus per cell. That's where you find it. There's the only ones where they show in the nucleus. And then they've got these thickened areas. Now, this is where two cells connect. And those are called the intercalated discs. 
And in those intercalated disks are the gap junctions that hold them tightly together, but also have the ion channels down to the center. All right, and so, you know, there, there we go. I think that shows that rather, rather nicely. Uh, so if you want this slide, you'll just have to download it. Cardiac muscle contracts and relaxes pretty rapidly. 72 times a minute, that's kind of average. Uh, you know, probably 60 to 72 is where most people are going to be. Yes, uh, it can go up to maybe 180, but you can't maintain that for long because eventually what are you going to do? You're going to run out of ATP, you're going to fatigue, you're going to fail, and if they do, what happens? You got it. All right. Another thing that's very interesting about cardiac muscle cells, very different from skeletal cells, they're able to actually contract and relax without any nervous stimulation whatsoever. They generate it themselves. They generate their own depolarization. Now, we'll save most of that for Bio 108, when you'll get plenty of talk about the conduction system in the heart. Can you have nervous stimulation? Oh, most assuredly so. But all it really does is speed it up and slow it down. And if someone's had a heart transplant, there probably aren't any nerve connections to the transplant part at all, and that's all right. It can still speed up and slow down. You climb the steps, it will speed up. You know, there are other ways, there are other ways of, of, of fine-tuning that conduction system within the heart. It can be done for mobility as well. All right, so there we go. So that is a very big difference between not only skeletal muscle, but even with smooth muscle as well. Now, speaking of which, that gets us to smooth muscle, and I think our time is just about all gone. So we'll pick up with that on Tuesday. We'll finish that off. Then we'll get to the nervous system and the brain, and then we'll soon be ready for the third exam.